Okay, I think I'm going to get started here. Um, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on which side of the uh, country you're on. Um, so my name is Don Bowman. Uh, my company is Agilicus. And we're going to talk today about uh, critical infrastructure security. And I'm going to give a case study and a demonstration associated with a, uh, a water treatment system. Uh, but this would apply to any industrial control system. So it could be an HVAC system, it could be uh, wastewater, solid uh, waste, it could be transportation, really anything that is in the field of operational technology. So something that isn't a desktop PC, a server and a printer, but is still a participant in the internet of things. And we're gonna talk about a specific risk here and uh, the reward that's associated with remote access, shared credentials, shared access to these systems, and how to do it in such a way that you're not exposing a VPN to your entire infrastructure. So uh, my name is Don Bowman. I'm the founder and CEO of Agilicus. Um, why am I here talking to you today? Uh, well, didn't have anything better to do. Passionate about the topic. I love network security. Uh, I've been involved in a large number of networking companies in Canada, and um, this is sort of my my jam. So. Before we start, I thought I'd ask a little poll. And it's anonymous, so don't worry what your answer is. Um, but the question is, do you have any vendors who use shared credentials to access your systems? And what that means uh, is, um, stupid thing. Uh, what that means is you've got a credential that's for a company, not an individual person that's out there. Um, so is there, you know, my MSP, my system integrator, or something like that? And are they, if so, sharing that thing to come in? And it looks like we've got a few answers coming in. Um, you don't all have to answer it if you don't want to, but uh, it is anonymous. And we'll give it one second, and I'll hit the publish button. So it looks like the majority of the folks are saying, uh, yes, there is a concept of shared credentials, two people, one password, if they will. So I'll just hit the publish button there. Okay, so before we get started, um, just keep that poll in mind and we're gonna come back to something like that at the end. So today, my objective is to convince you um, that there's a better way. Uh, the first thing is your team, the people that work directly for you. Uh, so they could be you know, contractors or full-time employees, not that important, but they all have a single identity, a single sign-on. You might view it as Azure, Office 365, or G Suite, but that, that's their identity. They sign in as user at your domain. And that's important because it means they don't have to write down a list of passwords, and you've been able to do great things with single sign-on and multi-factor and so on. But sort of got lost in the shuffle is your partners have that too. And their sign-in is at their company. So it's just as important for them, that single sign-on, as it is for you. And you're prepared to trust your partners. Their company is legitimate. They, you know, they've got good business practices. And really, it comes down to how do we gasket the individual users who work for that company into our systems? I think you should be prepared to say, I trust company X. If they hire and fire somebody, I'm, you know, I just need to be hooked into that process. But I don't think you should create parallel accounts. I don't think you should say, create a contractor account, user, remote, um, I think that's going to be difficult because when that person leaves the company, you won't know to take it out. So I, as a consequence, I think that many of you are hampering your partners by not using this concept of a single identity across multiple companies, which is called federation, so federated identity. I'm here today to convince you that you can have very, very segmented user resource access with a concept called zero trust. So what this means is instead of a VPN, my, my partner is allowed access to my network and the network has a bunch of stuff and they just stay away from the stuff they shouldn't. Instead, it's, you know, they're, I'm granting access to the thing that they need to do their job. And that means that the blast radius of a potential problem is reduced. We don't have to worry about, you know, somebody brings some ransomware in and it walks sideways. It's only reduced to the thing that they can get access to. Um, and that this is going to increase your security at the same time, increasing convenience and decreasing cost. It's just a much simpler experience. You know, from your standpoint, you put in place this VPN, 
from their standpoint, they, they support 100 people like you, and each of you has a different VPN, it ends up kind of hard for them, and uh, we represent a simpler way to achieve that objective. So um, what we're all about is that simple, secure access, you know, taking that single identity from your identity provider, from your partner's identity providers, and then being able to grant access to it. So there's three phases of the problem. There's the who phase, who is the person, there's the what phase, what are they authorized to do, and there's the how phase, how do we get them there? We own the second two, but we don't create another new user. We feel that that's a thing that's kind of solved in the universe. Great companies like Okta and Microsoft and Google have, have done that already. So my agenda today is uh, coming back to the industrial control systems, the SCADA, the water treatment, the wastewater, the things that have IPs but aren't servers and desktops. There's a legitimate need for people to access these remotely. So, you know, people would like to say, well, we'll just have a full, uh, real physical air gap, come into the building and do the work. But the reality is that decreases our, or increases our mean time to repair. Something happens, somebody has to get in a plane and then a car and then drive there and you have to meet them and open the door. Um, it's not the best and it's expensive and it's, it's hard for them and lots of reasons. Um, so there's legitimate reasons to have remote connectivity uh, for these trusted partners. But the problem with critical infrastructure is exactly the first two words of it. It's critical and it's infrastructure. You know, we can't afford to have the water treatment plant down because we had unfettered remote access and we didn't really know who was doing what. And all of a sudden the pipes have rusted because there's too much chlorine in them. So today we're going to talk about how to enable that secure access to things that are very legacy, like SCADA, without using a VPN. And I'm going to show you a live demo, a live dramatic demo. So my problem statement today is uh, industrial systems have almost no security. It's just awful. You know, in the IT space, we're used to the idea of sort of the Microsoft Patch Tuesday and so on. You know, there's a constant stream of security researchers finding problems and then the vendors patching them and thus applying the patches to machines that are willing to accept them. In industrial control systems, those machines might never get a patch from the day they're shipped. The, the vendor might not provide one. It might be a very different upgrading environment. People are loath to do it. Like, oh my God, if I take the water treatment system down, you know, people are gonna have my head on a plate, but they have actually worse problems than our, than our desktops do, than our browsers do. Buffer overflows, there's no use of encryption here. They have single shared passwords. Like there's a device bolted to the, my wall and the password is written on a post-it note. There's no username, it's just a password. It's unchangeable, it's part of the hardware. Um, and these things last for decades. You know, people are kind of wringing their hands about having to support a four-year-old laptop and there's a 30-year-old thing bolted in a room down the hall that keeps people alive. Um, so if Darwin had his way, these things would have all died out a long time ago, but there's no evolution because these things don't breed. But as soon as they do, it's going to be like Terminator. Um, each of these systems are maintained by specialists in their field. So people that understand this is a programmable logic controller, a PLC, this thing is responsible for this, this is a motor, this is how I do my work. And these are companies and they have more than one on staff and they have staff rotation. People come and go from the company. Um, and that's a problem when you have a shared credential, the company has it, which means those people have it, which means some of the people that don't work there have it, and at best they've left on good terms. So if you force people to come on site, you reduce their efficiency. If you allow them to work remote, you import their business risk. And this is a kind of a Gordian knot of complexity that we're gonna talk about. So if, exp if I expand on that, a lot of remote support comes down to one of two approaches. There's either the remote desktop, there's PC in the environment, and we're gonna use TeamViewer to it. So on the surface, that's a good thing. You know, it's relatively simple, it works, it's very compatible. The problem is, A, in the industrial world, these PCs often can't be logged out. So IT people are used to the idea of, it's a Windows PC, we update it on patch Tuesday, and it's on the domain and so on. And the industrial people are used to, okay, it runs Windows XP and you can't log out of it or it breaks, so just leave it alone. And uh, those things don't reconcile well, particularly when you have remote desktop to it. The problem with the remote desktop is one person with that password and they're just on the console. That machine in turn has east-west connectivity elsewhere in your organization uh, and there's no audit trail. 
you don't know who did what when, and you're going to need it. And also, there's no multi-factor. There's no different identity. It's just everybody acts as one user here. So if that's not that great, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is often the VPN. And I'll let you in on a dirty little secret in the industrial world. It's very common for there to be a little device bolted into your closet that you never see unless you're looking with a flashlight and it has a cellular modem in it. So it skips that fancy new firewall and web application firewall and an SSL inspecting thing that you just bought. And it just loops you straight out there. And you'll see these from a company, for example, Ewan uh, makes a product like that. And it's in there because the system integrator needed it to do their job and it was convenient and they bolted it in but it doesn't do a lot for making your security easy to model. And when you VPN to a network, you sort of connect two networks together. It's kind of like crossing the streams in Ghostbusters. It wasn't really a good thing except for the ending. Um, so this is really something you want to prefer to avoid is bringing somebody else's business network into your network together because then who knows what's going to walk across it. People come and go, shared credentials are forever and expanding. This is our problem statement today. So let's talk about that in detail. I'm not going to go into a lot of details of the threats. You've heard a lot of people out there scaring you, but the reality is ransomware loves municipalities. And the reality is that cyber breaches are one in five are due to compromised credentials. And you can beat people up to have stronger passwords, but as soon as you're sharing them, it's shared. And as soon as the company that has, has it isn't, doesn't work directly for you, your business policies are difficult to enforce. So ransomware is going after municipal critical infrastructure is the most critical part there. Uh, things aren't going to look good. So if you think about sort of three independent types of folks and the sort of four classes of system, you know, I've got my staff, I've got my partners, and then I got the people that built it or, or sort of integrated it. So your partner might be the water management company. They're, you know, adjusting the chlorine and salt and so on. And then the integrator might be the person who constructed the PLC and the control system. And then you have these sort of four types of systems in there. You hear a lot about an HMI, human machine interface. So this is the thing the operator pokes on with that other finger or turns knobs and says, pump go faster, temperature go hotter. Um, you need access to this remotely. And sometimes that's only a read-only access need. So maybe, you know, your, your partner that's debugging something with you would be satisfied with just seeing what you see on the screen. If you could achieve that, you'd be better off. The PLC. PLCs are, they're very basic devices from a networking standpoint. They do very great things in control systems with, you know, temperature and GPIO pins. But when it comes down to being networkable devices, they either have no networks or very, very simple networks that support protocols like Modbus, which is not what we're used to with IP and TCP and effectively has no security. If you can access it on Ethernet, you own the device. Um, and they are very easy to discover because they chirp out their information quite periodically. You see a lot of thin clients. So these are usually web apps. This is usually the HMI or something like it. And this web page, it's available to see status and things of that nature. And then often this remote desktop, which is either VNC, which is a very, very common or remote desktop if it's a Windows environment. And each of these people has a legitimate need some of the time to do something on some of these systems. So what are my challenges? I need to enable it to all locations. Some of the locations might not be on my corporate network. You know, I've got a remote office outside of town and it has satellite connectivity or cellular connectivity or a local VPN or sorry, local ISP. It doesn't come back to my building, which means that I can't rely on my sort of central VPN infrastructure and so on to get there. Um, my resources are shared between employees, third parties and vendors so that it's greater pool of risk. And my access tools I have available like a VPN, they just don't solve it. Like, Maybe I'll put in a jump box, but some of these sites are separate of multiple jump boxes. This is what sort of the challenges are that people face. So the current remote access tools, they really do fall short. They encourage creating either shadow users or shared credentials. They often don't obey the corporate multi-factor um, guidelines. Um, you know, they, it's just a username and password without any second factor. You know, by this stage of the game, we all know 
the lowest cost, highest reward thing we can do to improve security is multi-factor and just apply it on everywhere, on everybody, on everything. So if that was free and didn't cost any money and didn't cost any time, everybody would have done it already. So it's really about making that possible and achievable and getting the best bang for the buck. And what I believe is that the critical infrastructure is the next big bang for the buck. We kind of got the email systems done. Now it's about water treatment. How can we get water treatment so that a person who is my system integrator signs in with multi-factor when they don't work directly for me? Privilege controls is another one. You know, people talk a lot about access as if it was a Boolean. They've got full access or nothing access. And I view it as more shades of gray. You know, I talked earlier about the HMI or the VNC. So a lot of cases where people would be just as effective to see what you're doing without being able to interact with it. And if you, if you can achieve that objective or in the HMI, if it's the thin client, to be able to do a get but not an HTTP post to it. So that traditional VPN, um, you know, you come into your bastion, your castle and moat. This is a this is a moat. This is a castle. And the valid user comes in and they're offered access to nearly everything. And some people say, well, I use micro segmentation. I use VLANs to you know, segment things off. And those are definitely good practices. But when the rubber hits the road, inevitably, there's more than one thing on the segment. And um, the user is able to get there by accident or on purpose. But the other things that come in with those stolen credentials or those users that have left, same access. So how do we adopt this concept of zero trust and why would we? So first, let's talk about what is zero trust. Um, so zero trust, it, it's very near and dear to my heart. I'm very passionate about it. Uh, we founded this company on the principle of making it accessible. And I view it as sort of three phases of the problem. The first is the who phase, identity. Who is this person? We have a very unique strategy. We don't create a new who. Uh, there's no create a new username here. It's just I use one of the existing usernames and we authenticate against that system. So they see the same sign and they've always done. This is very important because for phishing protection, your number one defense is your staff. If they understand the login experience and they understand it's been tampered with, they won't use it. Therefore, you want to give them the smallest number of login experiences possible, ideally one. So for a lot of you, you use Office 365. You're familiar with the Microsoft flow. If everything used the same Microsoft flow, much greater defense. So the first phase of zero trust is I have to know who that person is. The second is the what phase, the authorization. What are they allowed to do? And the what needs to be more fine grained than everything or nothing. So you need to be thinking about that person can administer, that person can modify, that person can read. And this is something you can't outsource. We're prepared to outsource identity to Microsoft, to Google, to Apple, to Okta, but we have to own authorization because it's what our business is. So I'm okay with saying my partner at Microsoft's Office 365. I'm not okay with saying Microsoft can say what they do or they can say what they do. I need to own that. And the third phase of this pipeline is the how. So how do we get them there? That building's outside of town. It's got an access via satellite. The satellite has network address translation. There's no inbound possible. It's outbound only. So that's what we supply. Is we supply the how and the what, and we integrate with the who. But zero trust is about that triplet. It's each resource individually authorized and identified. So user Don is allowed to read the wiki. That doesn't mean anything that user Don can do to the payroll system that's beside it. Zero trust is about making no inherent assumption that about me based on where I come from or my source IP address or anything like that. It's assuming that every device you own is on the public internet and every user is on the public internet, and there's nothing to trust until they supply that information individually. So zero trust has gone from a bit of a um, you know, future looking thing, maybe 10 years ago, to a best practice today. And a big standard bearer for this has been the United States National Institute of Standards Technology. They got a whole slew of standards around zero trust under the, this SP 800 family and it talks about a set of best practices. The important thing to remember is this is more of a conceptual architecture. You know, there's lots of different ways to implement it and there's no one solution for everybody. And in fact, many people will have more than one. 
But NIST sort of specifies what's a password, when is it allowed, what's a multi-factor, what's a resource, et cetera, for you. And you'll see that a lot. You'll see that, you know, a lot of you folks might be responsible for issuing RFPs. You would ask it in an RFP. Does, how does your solution support a NIST SB800 zero trust architecture? Um, the second is it's here in Canada, it's the uh, recommended strategy by the Treasury Board of Canada, uh, which is responsible for their cloud strategy um, and the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Um, the CIO strategy of Council Canada also recognizes it. This is just today's best practice uh, for security is that this thing, that user, this action, that is what we authorize rather than this user, everything. And What's also driving this a lot is the United States federal government under both the current president and the previous has a set of mandates in this area, a set of executive letters, which have flowed to the states and flowing downwards through their hierarchy as well. So you're starting to see that hardening approach uh, being used. And a lot of it is around critical infrastructure, whether it be boats or planes or canals or water treatment or what have you. People are worried about those things. From a municipal standpoint, you know, municipalities buy products, they don't design and build them themselves. Um, so what they're really looking to do is how can I do an incremental adoption? I can't really go and change my world. I want to achieve that who, what, when, precise control and visibility. How do we step into that? And you've made great investments in the last few years in identity with Okta, Office 365, Azure, Active Directory, Google, G Suite, etc. Now it's time to reap the rewards. Your partners have done it. You've done it. Now let's eliminate those shared credentials. So from a security strategy, authentication, who is that user, authorization, what are they allowed to do, accept the upstream who, enforce the, the what yourself. That's what we're going to talk about today. Okay. I am now going to switch to the dramatic demo. And the dramatic demo has never failed in the history of time, so there's no foreshadowing here. But let us get into it. So this is something we we did with a um, uh, partner of ours, and their challenge was what you know what I just talked about. You know, everybody has the same generic classes of challenges. In their case, there's a machine on site, and it hosts their SCADA infrastructure, um, their HMI, and their integration. What's called their historian. And it's a Windows 7 device, and it can't be logged out. If it logs out, it stops treating water. So you can't log it out. So as a consequence of that, it can't have different users, right? And it's not on the domain. And it's running Windows 7, so it doesn't have patches anyway. And so there's no security updates. So this is already a bit of a red flag. People are raising some eyebrows. But don't worry, that machine will be with them for another 10 years. So, you know, they're happy with it. The machine needs a secure, always-on connection to the city data center for a specific item associated with a SCADA historian. SCADA historians like big data for industrial it logs, the you know the stats, how much chlorine, how many units of water, and so this is great. Now, not only does this thing exist, this thing exists insecurely, but it also has a legitimate reason to access other things that I would prefer to keep secure. And there's multiple internal and external users that have a legitimate need to access this thing. There's a company that does the actual water management themselves, like the, you know, like I said, the settings of how much chlorine and, you know, heat and treatment and so on. There's another one, which is the integrator, you know, the, the pumps as they age, they start slowing down a little bit and people have to tweak the thresholds for when they turn on and off and so on. That's the, the integrator that built it. And then there's the, the city staff themselves that are licensed water operators that, that oversee this. So you've got three groups with three identity providers that need to access a thing, which is basically a dumpster fire. And that thing has to be connected to the crown jewels. So um, the good thing about this is it was done using uh, port forwarding and a DMZ with no other introspection and no multi-factor. So uh, the main good thing is that it mostly didn't get caught. So this is where we came on the scene. So how can we improve that? So think about the slices here. Federated identity, we're going to allow user at water co, user at integrator, user at town, each to sign in with their corporate identity called federation. We are then going to bring it through centralized authorization management. The town says these 
nine people, not companies, people based on their corporate identity have the permission to do something on this system. And then we're gonna do the how. So we did the who, the what, now we're doing the how, how do we get them there? And in this case, we're using our technology, which creates an outbound only connection. And then we've locked all other network access to that machine. So the machine can make an outbound connection on port 443 to us. And there's no, in, no inbound traffic allowed at all, not even in the site. You know, if you're right next to it and you ping it, it won't respond. If it tries to reach out to the internet, it won't respond. And this is good because it means if somebody walks in with a USB key and plugs it in and puts some ransomware on there, it likely won't activate because it can't call home. So it's another layer of protection here. But it also means if something bad happens to this machine, it doesn't ooze outwards and sideways, uh, which is defense in depth. So those are the three stages. Um, I'm going to do the demo. So with that, give me one second and I will switch over and share my screen. Share that window. Okay. So screen should be now shared. Okay, perfect. So there's a couple different pieces of our solution. I'll talk you through sort of the end user facing, we call it profile, but it's basically a launch pad. You don't have to use it. In our model, every resource and device gets a host name and an SSL certificate as if it were on the public internet. So you can just type in a URL and go to it. But in this particular case, there's an HMI, which is what I'm about to demonstrate the login experience for, which is that human machine interface. This is the user interface panel of the water system. And mine is just mocked up. So you, when, you, when you see me set the water temperature to 10 million degrees, I'm not really changing someone's water. Um, but also sometimes there's other things. Sometimes you find there's files. The system integrator needs to see the log files. And this is what we call a share. And by this stage of the game, we've also now realized that Windows SMB shares and ransomware are, are pretty tightly coupled. Um, so we're, we're reluctant to let this Windows 7 machine with no security have a share, but we use a protocol called WebDAV, which brings it into HTTP. They can mount it on their own desktops. They can just use it over the web. And also, sometimes there's a legitimate need to use the machine not through the thin client, and they can actually write in the browser, um, open it. Now, you didn't see me log in because I'm already signed in. We see how easy that was. In a second, you're going to see me log in as user at integrator, and I've got access. And it supports a read-only mode and a read-write mode, so you can have someone have a read-only access so they can help diagnose something with you at the same time. So it supports uh, Microsoft RDP and BNC there. And then also, in a second, you'll see me um, probably curse as I get the multi-factor on, but sign in with multi-factor for it. You can enforce that multi-factor in that authorization scheme if you don't believe that your uh, partners have it turned on in their identity scheme. And this makes it, uh, it gives you a lot of peace at night. And this allows the, the user to sort of muck with that. And I'm going to use a, a web push notification. So my phone is going to chirp and say, was that you? But you can also use a YubiKey or a code generator or things of that nature. So with that, I'm going to switch over uh, to the HMI. So human machine interface. And um, for the sake of the demo, I'm forcing the login all the time. So the user has to log in every single time that they click on it. And they're just presented this uh, list of how you'd sign in. For the sake of my demo, people can sign in with any Microsoft account. So user at town, which would be your Office 365, or Google, which would be G Suite. Or in some cases, you have system integrators that have just a personal Gmail address. Signing in doesn't give permission. Signing in proves who you are so that the permissions can then be assessed. So this is a key thing that people get they're surprised at, you know, does this mean anyone with a Gmail can log in my water system? No, you still control that. So here, since we use uh, Google G Suite for our company, I'll sign with my corporate credentials. And the browser is already signed in as it usually is with these systems, so I don't supply a password. But I'm challenged for this additional second factor, and I have a lot of them because I've been playing with it. And now my phone is chirped, and I click on it, and... I blink and it sees my face and we should be there. And we're logged in. And there's a full audit trail for this and now we can go change the temperature. Remember it's not real water. And they'll see, oh my God, the temperature's going up and close some valves and so on. 
but that's what we're talking about here is you want to take it from a I VPN into the network and I have access to everything and then I've got a cell spreadsheet that has all the IP addresses of the stuff I'm supposed to talk to to a each thing is individually signed in. There's an audit trail for this. I can only get to the things I, I'm allowed to. The town administrator, the city administrator is able to control who has access to what. As an end user, it's simpler because I don't have to deal with the balkanization of a VPN for every customer I support and which parameters do they have and maybe I need a virtual machine because they can't coexist with each other. I don't have to remember new users and passwords. I use my existing natural native identity. The town, the city administrator doesn't have to worry when their partner fires somebody on the team, that person's immediately removed from their identity system. They're taken out here. I don't have to remember to get a memo at the end of the month. Um, it just works. So with that, we'll go back to our slides. So that was the demonstration. Uh, we can talk about it a bit in the chat at the end, or obviously we'd love to um, chat with you afterwards if you'd like. And oh, the poll came back. So I wonder if anybody changed their mind since earlier after I redefined shared credentials and I talked about some of the things that go bump in the night. Um, so earlier we had a fairly high um, response rate that suggested we have shared credentials. I wonder if anybody has reevaluated their earlier or no. So we'll just give it a second or two. This is more for fun because it is it is anonymous. I can't see the responses. Um, we're not going to call anybody out. So we'll just give it just another couple of seconds here. Keep it interactive. Keep people on the lean forward instead of the lean back experience. Okay, we're going to call it in 30 seconds. Anybody still click happy? Going once, going twice, and it is going out the door. All right, so there we go. Uh, I don't know if that's different than the last one. That wasn't the point. The point was just mainly to make it a bit interactive. Um, so most folks agree with the statement. There is some use of shared credentials to access some critical infrastructure. So just to sum it up, um, here's my call to action. Um, and for those who don't know, that's Veronica Foster. She uh, was she worked in Toronto during World War II, stamping out a bunch of machine guns. And she was sort of a call to action nationally for things. In the US, they reimagined her as Rosie the Riveter. But uh, there she is looking cool and dying of cancer. Um, the call to action industrial control edition. So leave this call. First thing you want to do, well, contact me. We'll, we'll, we'd love to talk with you. But the first thing you want to do is uh, think about how can I get rid of this shared credentials issue? Um, we should have one login, one user, one credential with their natural identity provider. How are we going to achieve that? There's different ways you can achieve that. I'd love to help you with that problem, but other people can help you with that problem as well. The second is remove any use of overbroad authorization. So I VPN to the network is not as good as this user signs into that device. So there's no, should be no peeking sideways across the network. We call that lateral traversal. Enable ubiquitous multi-factor. So some systems are difficult to do it with. You have a router, the router supports SSH. Everybody's got the password for SSH. You need to do it, use the router. I'll fix that for you. I'll make it so you can SSH that router using your web-based Office 365 credentials and supply a second factor, and it won't change the router. I won't, you won't have to reconfigure it. I can fix that problem for you. You've got a machine running Windows 7 that's always logged in that can't get patches. It's, it's connected back to Town Hall. I'll fix that for you. I'll make it so the only access is by read-only BNC for authenticated users with multi-factor. I'll make it so that connection that's back to Town Hall can only do one thing, which is what it's supposed to. It can't get any further. I will fix that for you. And trust but verify. Make sure there's always an audit log for who did what and when, and that who needs to be a person. It needs to be their face. It can't be the company, because then that's where it gets really fuzzy. It's like, oh, I don't think that was anyone who still works here. I wonder where else that is. And suddenly the worry, that gnawing thing in your gut happens. I wonder what else is going on. And it might be just nothing wrong, but you don't have an audit trail. 
the first thing anybody asks, what else did they get? And you're like, I don't know. There should be an audit trail. So with that, leverage those big investments in identity, recognizing Microsoft, Google, Okta, et cetera, achieve these objectives. Your partners may have made different choices than you, but the standards are now very simple to integrate. It's no real work here. Um, and um, with that, what you need to do is leverage that identity, own that authorization, and then be safe out there. And um, we'd love to help you with that with Zero Trust. And as Bridget noted there, uh, there is a public chat. If you would like, you can ask questions in it, or you can email me afterwards. Um, you can email info at Agilicus or Don at Agilicus, um, and I'll make sure that somebody gets in touch with you and we can chat one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you're welcome to tell me I'm wrong. Uh, you're welcome to say, hey, but you forgot about this other thing, or you oversimplified that. But I, I really am passionate on this subject. There's machines that run that could be accessed via VNC that could have that simple web login. There's machines that have SSH that could have a very simple web-based interaction there and still be SSH at the end of it. There are shares that could be made available to third parties without making SMB involved. There are SCADA control systems, historians, HMIs that can be legitimately accessed as individual users without having to VPN into it. You can have your security, you can make it cheaper, and you can make it simpler at the same time. And that's really what we all want here. So with that, I'll give it a couple of questions, a couple of minutes of their questions. Uh, we do have a case study on our website. Um, if you're interested, that goes into a bit more detail about uh, that partner we did that water one for, but I think I covered the juicy bits. Windows 7, can't log out, got to reach City Hall, can't have patches, multiple people need to share it. If it dies, water dies, people die. You know, that's sort of, um, you know, the nut of the industrial control system problem. You'll also see it in HVAC thermostats in the pool, in the, um, in the city hall, and whatever. You'll also see it in other treatment plants, uh, wastewater, um, et cetera. So with that, I haven't seen any questions come in yet. I'll give it one more minute. Looks like people are just making their, their way to the great egress. Uh, we will post the recording of this online on the website, the same spot you're registered, and we'll send a thank you note afterwards with a link. Okay, everybody, uh, thanks so much, and have a good afternoon. Cheers. Bye-bye.